Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this SIAC China webinar on review of recent arbitration-related developments in China. My name is Perry, and I'm pleased to be your MC this afternoon. Thank you all for taking the time to join us to discuss the rapidly changing international arbitration landscape in China. If I may now introduce the panel. Our panelists are Mr. Tao Li Jin, member of the SIAC Court of Arbitration and partner at Zhonglun Law Firm, Mr. Chong Yilong, member of the SIAC Board of Directors and partner at Ellen and Gladwell LLP. And we also have Mr. Philip Yang, independent arbitrator. Moderating the panel is Mr. Zhang Chunyuan, Chief Representative and Deputy Head at SIAC. Chunyuan, please. Okay, thank you very much, Perry. So hello everyone. Uh, it is a great, great honor to have you here and have our three distinguished panelists. So today's webinar will cover uh, three, three subtopics, uh, very, very hot subtopics of in China's arbitration community. The first one is about the uh, recent Chinese court decisions, which confirms the validity of the SIC arbitration agreement, providing Shanghai as a seat. And the second one is a China's recent policies that allows non-PRC arbitration institutions to set up case management offices in designated areas of China. And the third topic uh, would be the Hong Kong mainland, uh, mainland China interim measures agreement. So without further ado, so I would like to introduce, uh, to allow our first speakers, Mr. Chong Yin Leong to, uh, to, to address the first subtopic. Thank you, Mr. Chong. Thank you very much, uh, Jun Yuan. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Good to be here and to be talking to, to all of you. I am uh, dealing with this interesting case that have a reason recently, the case of Daesung Industrial Gases Company Limited and Prasia China Investment. Uh, this is a case that actually started off in Singapore. And it is a case that deals with an arbitration clause that we are seeing actually becoming more popular and it is actually a very good uh, opportunity for courts on, in both countries, in Singapore and in China, to clarify the laws with respect to case, uh, clauses that are similar to such cases. We move on to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yep, okay. Uh, my, my, my presentation is, is broken up into uh, five portions that is the background i will talk a bit about the background of the case and how it came about then we talk about the, the the tribunal's decisions and then it went before the singapore courts there are two decisions before the singapore courts a high court decision and a court of appeal decisions and then the case went to the shanghai number one intermediate people's court and we'll talk a bit about that decision and then i'll open up to a bit of, of discussion about these cases okay let's move on to the next slide please Okay, now this is a, the, the case concerning a takeout agreement, which is an agreement for entered into by the two parties, Daesung and Prasia, to uh, sell and purchase industrial gas. And the, the case, the agreement was actually for the Daesung, which is a Korean company to sell industrial gas to Brasia, which is a Chinese uh, company. And in between, there was another company that was, uh, I think, established in, in, in China by Daesung and who took over the responsibility of the sales of the gas. So there are two parties that are actually on one side, Daesung and the Chinese companies, which is a, uh, uh, has a Korean connection. And Prasia, which is the a Chinese company that bought the gas. And it, essentially the, the facilities, the sales, the gas are all taking place in China. Okay, the only foreign element to it is actually the party being uh, Daesung, a Korean company. And you, if you look at the arbitration agreement that was set out in the, uh, in the slides, is in Article 14 disputes. Now, 14.1 actually set out the governing law, and the governing law of the agreement is the law of People's Republic of China, Chinese law. 
And if you look at 14.2, it deals with the dispute resolution clause. And it talks that, it says that it is agreed by both parties that such dispute shall be finally submitted to the Singapore International Arbitration Center, SIAC, for arbitration in Shanghai, which, shall be, which will be conducted in accordance with its arbitration rules. Okay, that's how the clause is worded. Now move on to the next slide. Okay, uh, that dispute arose out of the agreement and the Korean company plus is a, a Chinese uh, uh, related company commenced arbitration in 2016 at the SIAC. And Prasia then objected to the tribunal's decision. Now, what is the objection? The objection is this. They say that the proper law of the arbitration is actually PRC law. And if PRC law is a proper law of the arbitration, then the arbitration agreement is invalid. It's because Article 16 of the PRC arbitration law requires the arbitration agreement to, spe uh, uh, to specify an arbitration commission. And the arbitration commission must be established in municipalities, seats of government of, of provinces or autonomous regions and registered with the relevant administrative department of justice and be a member of China Arbitration Association. And we all know that SIAC does not qualify and does not fulfill those requirements. And therefore the, the respondent actually here says that, well, you know, if you look at it, um, uh, an SIAC arbitration in Shanghai on frankly, in any part of, of China would be invalid because uh, it doesn't fulfill the requirements of Article 16. Move on to the next slide, please. So moving that, if you look at it, uh, one, one possible interpretation is that, which is the interpretation that the respondent here, the Chinese company is pressing for is this, that PRC law applies to the arbitration agreement. PRC law uh, does not permit foreign arbitral institution to administer PRC CETA arbitration. And PRC law does not permit a foreign arbitration institution to administer a purely domestic dispute. And therefore, the arbitration agreement is invalid under PRC law. And therefore, the tribunal does not have jurisdiction. Okay, that is the argument that is being put forth by the respondent in that case. Now, it went before the tribunal. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and the tribunal look at it, and uh, they they came out with a decision on, on the jurisdiction. Now it, it is a majority decision because the, the the tribunal couldn't achieve consensus. It was two against one. The majority decision says that well, actually we have jurisdiction, and their reasoning is this: they say that well, it doesn't make sense for parties to agree to a very comprehensive arbitration agreement. Then for, in, for them to apply a law that will make it invalid, right? And therefore, uh, it is the, although the governing law of the contract is PRC, and that will make the, presum, uh, the, the PRC the presumptive choice of the, of the law governing the arbitration agreement. But because of that factor, the presumption presumptive choice is actually displaced by Singapore law. And how the Singapore law comes into play? Now move to the next slide, please. Next slide, yep. The way that the, the reasoning for Singapore law to apply is this. They say that if you look at the clause, it just says that uh, the arbitration shall take place in, in Shanghai. It doesn't say that Shanghai is the seat of arbitration. And in fact, the rules that were applied to the agreement was the 2013 edition of the SIAC rules, which provides that in default of, a, of a express choice by the party, Singapore is actually the seat of the arbitration. So they say that, well, Shanghai is not the seat, but Singapore is the seat. And if Singapore is the seat, then Singapore law actually could be the law that governs the arbitration agreement. And given that you have Singapore law and you have Chinese law, and Chinese law would invalidate the clause, but Singapore law would not. So Singapore law is actually the, the suitable choice or rather the more appropriate choice to govern the arbitration clause. 
and therefore the clause is valid and the tribunal has jurisdiction. That is the reasoning of the majority. Move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so that's, that's, that's what it says. And uh, the, the tribunal says that actually the reference to Shanghai is just a reference to the venue of the arbitration, not the seat of the arbitration. The minority decision is actually more straightforward. If you move on to the next slide. Uh, the minority decision is very straightforward. It says that, look at it. Uh, PRC law is a proper law of the, of the contract. The contract has got multiple connections to PRC. Uh, so there's nothing to displace it. And it says that, that arbitration is in Shanghai means Shanghai is a seat and therefore the, the clause is invalid. Now, one thing to notice is this, they say that when the, when the parties argue the, the, the jurisdictional challenge, the Chinese party actually proceeded on the basis of a very strong basis that if PRC law applies, definitely PRC law would not allow an SIC arbitration in China. The Korean companies took a less stringent position, but they effectively also considered, they say that, well, if PRC law applies, it is very likely that the, the clause will be invalid because PRC does not allow the SIAC arbitration in China. So that was the position of the party. So one has to look at it. And actually the tribunal was actually presented with a black and white situation. You know? If they choose uh, PRC law, that means that they won't have jurisdiction. And if they choose Singapore law, they will have jurisdiction. And that's why the majority actually took the position that Singapore law should apply because they, are looking at the validity principles that you know they'll try to interpret it in a way that will not render the arbitration clause invalid. So uh, the the Chinese party who lost was not happy, so they applied to the court to appeal against the jurisdictional decision. And please move on to the next slide. We go to the Singapore court. Okay, next slide. Now it went before the Singapore court, and the High Court actually says that. Well, uh, I think the tribunal is correct because arbitration in Shanghai doesn't necessarily mean that Shanghai is the seat. It can be the venue. And the, the, the judge actually said the SIC seat selected by the parties expressly provide the SIC rules, which I talked about, the 2013 rules, actually, actually provide for Singapore as a default seat. Now, the 2016, I should clarify, which is the latest rule that applies, does not have that default position anymore, but the 2013 have that default position. And therefore, uh, the, the High Court said that Singapore law should apply and therefore the seat is a valid, uh, the, the arbitration clause is a valid clause. And one additional argument that the court actually came up with, which was not pushed by the party was this, they said that, well, Shanghai is a city and not really a jurisdiction in the sense that it's a law district. Well, Singapore is a law district. And therefore, it's more likely that Singapore law is actually the, the, the governing law. Move on to the next slide, please. Okay, and so therefore, the court came out with the, with the decision that Singapore law applies because uh, the presumption has been displaced. And uh, it, they applied Singapore law so that to preserve the validity of the arbitration agreement. And parties were not happy. And if they went to the Court of Appeal, uh, next slide, please. Okay, now Court of Appeal actually look at it afresh and they, they came up with, uh, at that time, what, what I would say, uh, the, the arbitration committee in Singapore thought was an uh, unusual decision. They say this, they say, well, if you look at the phrase, arbitration in Shanghai naturally means that Shanghai is a seal. There's nothing else in the clause to, to displace that presumption that arbitration in Shanghai means uh, PRC or Shanghai is a seat of arbitration. Now, the, that is not surprising. The surprising thing is this. Uh, move on to the next slide. So they say that, well, if, if Shanghai is a seat, then uh, if you look at it, it is Singapore cannot be the seat. And if Singapore is not a seat, then everything falls within PRC law, you know, the governing law is PRC, seat is in Shanghai, the lex arbitrae is, is PRC law. So in all likelihood, PRC law will also govern the arbitration agreement. But having said that, the Court of Appeal refused to
to make a decision as to whether, whether the arbitration agreement was valid or invalid under PRC law because they said that, well, we, we are not the supervisory uh, court anymore because Singapore is not the seat. The supervisory court is really the Shanghai court because the seat is in Shanghai. So Shanghai court should decide whether it's valid or not. It's not for us, Singapore, to say whether it's valid or not. So they say, well, if they leave it to the party to decide how they want to proceed. But effectively, they're, they're saying that, well, let, let the Shanghai court decide whether uh, SIC can conduct an arbitration in, in, in PRC. Now, next slide, please. Okay, so, so that's what they say. So the left opened the question of whether the clause is a valid clause or invalid clause under PRC. So the parties did the next the logical thing, which is to go to Shanghai. Next slide. Okay, they went to Shanghai. And then uh, the Shanghai Intermediate People's Court, number one Intermediate People's Court said, well, the arbitration agreement is actually a valid agreement under PRC law because it satisfies Article 16. There's intention to arbitrate, that the defined scope of matters which can be referred to arbitration, and the selection of an arbitration commission, which is SIAC. So they said it is an it is a valid clause, and therefore the tribunal has uh, uh, jurisdiction, which uh, actually is something I think pretty surprising to the party because they have always proceeded, even in Singapore, that if PRC law applies, the arbitration agreement will have been invalid. Uh, next slide, please. And the Shanghai court rejected the contention that PRC law does not permit foreign arbitration institution. They say parties are free to agree on arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism. And they say the Supreme People's Court has issued an official reply in Anhui Long Lita Packaging, Printing, and BP Aknati, confirming that parties can agree in agreement involving foreign elements to have a foreign arbitral institution administer domestic arbitration, so long as Article 16 of the PRC arbitration law has been satisfied. Next slide. So they say that there's no express restriction on foreign arbitral institution from conducting arbitration proceeding in PRC. And they say that, well, when the arbitration law in PRC was first promulgated, there was a lack of international vision resulting in the imperfect arbitration legislation, which are out of step with the international commercial arbitration. So Prasia's contention of contended interpretation of PRC law as imposing restriction on accepted arbitration commissions would need to be resolved by legislation. So they accept that actually legislation would be the way to do it. But until then, they say the Supreme Court, the Supreme People Court uh, decision in Anhui Longita has answered that question. So in fact, they say that, well, the court decision, the Mr. Longita decision and this Daesung uh, decision, effectively decide that foreign arbitration commission can conduct uh, uh, arbitration in PRC provided it has got a foreign element. Next slide. Okay, uh, there's a few points I'd like to make very quickly. Uh, go on, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, it, it's best when you draft across, of course, to specify very clearly where your seat is, to say that the arbitration should take place in Shanghai or in London or in Singapore. It's not exactly very clear. Although in, 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 in practice nowadays, most of them, will, most people will accept that as a reference to proceed, but to, to, to avoid any uh, ambiguity, you should specify where the seat is. Okay, next point, next slide. Uh, then the, the court of appeal said that, well, it is correct that the jurisdiction challenge is brought before the, the tribunal first. And if the tribunal decides that Singapore is a seat, then it should go before the Singapore court because otherwise, which would be the supervisory court because the tribunal has decided that Singapore is the correct uh, seat. Only when the Singapore courts decide that it is not the seat, then it has to go back to Shanghai, which is the seat that is decided by the court of, court of appeal. Move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so that's what they say. It's, it is the party. What the parties have done, in, in the sense, is the correct procedure, and that's how it should be, have been resolved. Next point. Next slide. Okay, now the the decision of the Shanghai court actually indicate a more open and internationalist outlook of uh, PRC arbitration landscape, and it actually clarifies the situation now as to whether a foreign institution, uh, arbitral institution like SIC actually can conduct arbitration and administer arbitration in PRC. 
Uh, move on to the next slide, please. However, uh, although the, the decision actually uh, uh, welcome clarity, uh, it's not sufficient clarity as, as we know that PRC is actually a civil law country. So uh, the law actually should, have been, should be found in actually legislation and in, 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 uh, in the statutes as opposed to uh, court decisions in, as in common law. So while uh, Lunglita and Desung has provided uh, the, the, the opening, uh, it will be good if that is actually uh, enacted in the legislation. And uh, an uh, answer or explanation is given as to whether registration requirement for arbitration institution, uh, commissions in the PRC law is required or not required. Uh, obviously, these are these are PRC's uh, uh, law matter, and I would of course defer to my uh, PRC colleague in terms of of how the the PRC court would deal with this. But you know, speaking as uh, uh, a member of the international arbitration community, I think it will be good if those clarification can be provided. I think I have exceeded my time, so I will just stop here. But if you have any question relating to this, I'm sure we will be happy or, or Li Jun or Philip will be very happy to take any question later on, on this issue. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chong. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, clear introduction of the relevant uh, history of the, the, background, the background and the key points of the core decisions. So I think the key takeaways for the, the corporate users, maybe who attend this webinar, is that uh, you really should specify the seat of the arbitration in the arbitration agreement. This is a point where many PRC users uh, overlook, and they should pay more attention to that point. And the second is that uh, for the current legal framework, PRC legal framework, I think it is still uh, not sufficiently clear about the state of the arbitration. So there is some legal risks if you if you choose a non-PRC arbitral institution and and agree a seat with in in mainland China. So if you if you still uh, agree on such arbitration agreement, there 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 is some legal uncertainties. I think that is the, the two key takeaways. So now let's let's uh, welcome Mr. Cao to introduce another which is somewhat related topic that is a recent PRC policies on the case management office of the non-PRC arbitral institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Sun Yuan. Um, oops. Well, uh, let me uh, start by saying, um, may I wish everyone good health and uh, uh, prosperity in the year of the ox. My topic, as Sun Yuan explained, is the recent uh, free trade zone policies that allow non-PRC institutions to set up uh, case management offices in the PRC. Well, uh, as you uh, have uh, already heard from uh, Ilian that uh, under PRC arbitration law, Article 16, uh, there's a requirement on designation of arbitration commission. And the arbitration commissions uh, need to possess se several qualifications as mentioned in Article 10 of the same law and need to be registered with the uh, uh, Department of uh, Ministry of Justice in the PRC. So clearly when the PRC arbitration law was enacted in 1994, uh, the possibility of uh, foreign institutions conducting arbitration in the PRC was not uh, conceived. Uh, so uh, for a long time, the interpretation uh, about the lack of a uh, uh, provision is that, uh, you know, foreign institutions are not allowed to conduct arbitration in the PRC, but that has changed uh, since 2015. The, uh, the foreign institutions now have uh, started to set up their uh, representative offices or even case management offices uh, in the PRC. There are two steps. The first step happened uh, in Shanghai in 2015 and in Beijing in 2017. That was about 
establishment of a representative offices. And the second step uh, happened only in recent years. It, it's in uh, 2019 in Shanghai and uh, in 2020, only two months ago for, for Beijing. Uh, uh, let me uh, go into some details. The uh, first step was introduced into uh, Shanghai by a state council plan issued in 2015. According to one of the provisions, uh, the government support the entry of internationally renowned commercial dispute resolution institution uh, in China. Uh, and that's uh, with regard to the Shanghai Free Trade Zone. It's called a pilot free trade zone. And uh, since 2015, several institutions started to set up their rep offices in China. Uh, those institutions include the ICC Court of Arbitration, Hong Kong and the Singapore International Arbitration Centers, Korean Commercial Arbitration Board, and uh, well, um, several other institutions such as, uh, in my view, uh, uh, in my memory, uh, WIPO. And uh, those institutions, uh, rep offices, was first registered, uh, registered with uh, uh, the AICs in Shanghai. AIC stands for Administration of Industry and Commerce. It's basically the business registry, corporate registry in the PRC. But later in 2017, the registration was switched to another government agency. It's the NGO office of a Shanghai Public Security Bureau after the PRC law on NGO came into effect that year. And uh, the activities of those uh, uh, representative offices are limited to liaison and uh, promotional activities. In other words, those institutions they are not uh, permitted to provide case administration work in the PRC. Well, uh, with regard to Beijing, uh, the uh, State Council issued uh, a similar provisions in 2017. Uh, that was a time when the free trade zone in Beijing was not even established. Uh, there are similar provisions and the rep offices are allowed to, end, uh, uh, to be opened under those provisions, but so far no arbitration has ever opened up uh, rep offices in Beijing. Well, the second step, uh, this happened uh, for Shanghai in 2019, when the Shanghai Free Trade Zone expanded to a new area called Lingang area. According to the State Council Framework Plan issued in 2019, the government allow establishment of a case management offices of foreign arbitration institutions in the Lingang area. And the government also uh, support and uh, um, guarantee that uh, the parties have access to interim measures such as uh, property preservation, evidence preservation, and the conduct preservation, which are the three major forms of inter interim measure in China. According to uh, you know, uh, uh, admin or implementing measures issued by the Shanghai Municipal Department of Justice or DOJ uh, the same year, uh, the foreign institutions are defined to include non-profit arbitral institution legally established in foreign countries, as well as in Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. Uh, but it also includes institutions established by foreign international organizations joined by uh, the PRC, such as uh, WIPO and the uh, ICC. And uh, according to another article in the implementing measures, the Shanghai Municipal Department of Justice is responsible for registration for those uh, case management offices. As for what these uh, case management offices can uh, do as their business. Article 14 of the implementing measure says that those case management offices can handle acceptance of cases, trial and hearing, and the issuance of awards. It can also handle case administration and services. 
as well as business consultation guidance, training and uh, academic studies, etc. It's also made clear in another article that uh, those case management offices cannot handle cases that does not have a foreign elements. And those uh, offices cannot establish further sub offices in China. So um, if you uh, read the detailed provisions of the DOGs implementing measures, you will note that uh, there are several uh, interesting points. Number one is that although uh, foreign institutions are required to register case management offices in the Lingang new area, their operation are not limited to that new area. And uh, uh, the parties who can seek arbitration are not limited to companies register in the Shanghai pre trade zone. And also um, one distinction between the implementing measures and the central government's framework plan is that the implementing measures do not mention anything about interim measures. So in other words, parties cannot rely on these implementing measures to seek access to interim measures from the court of the PRC. Since 2019, only one institution set up case management office in Shanghai, Lingang New Area, that is WIPO. And so far they have not accepted any arbitration cases according to the report. They have uh, instead received 18 mediation cases referred from the Shanghai court. And all these cases are IP cases. Uh, we are aware several institutions are considering set up uh, also case management offices uh, in China, but so far uh, there has been no uh, uh, further news in this aspect. So uh, for the Beijing uh, free trade zone, uh, similar things happened. There was a, a state council framework plan for the Beijing pilot free trade zone. And uh, according to uh, the, that uh, framework plan, parties should have access to interim measures from the court. And uh, there is also implementing measures from the Beijing Municipal DOJ, uh, uh, similar uh, to the Shanghai uh, implementing measures. I wouldn't go, to, uh, go into details on these issues. Uh, uh, the next, um, Topic, the next subtopic I would like to address is that now that uh, foreign institutions already established their either rep office or even case management office in China, has all these uh, old issues, such as uh, whether foreign institutions can conduct arbitration in China, uh, what uh, uh, whether the parties have access to interim measures, are these old issues resolved by now? The answer is still, uh, well, uh, I, I think there's still no clear answer to all those issues. Uh, one of the biggest uh, challenge is that there is no clear um, definition about the concept of a seat of arbitration in China under Chinese law. And uh, consequently, the supervisory court issue that um, Yi Liang mentioned in his uh, uh, presentation, and also the governing law, the law governing the arbitral procedure or the lex arbitrary, these are not uh, clearly provided under Chinese law. And also the issue uh, with regard to the nationality of arbitral award is also uh, ambiguous. There's no clear answer to that issue. And uh, uh, there's also a problem or doubt about the availability of interim measures for those arbitrations conducted by foreign institutions offices in China. 
uh, well, uh, as I said, the set of arbitration is not clearly defined under the PRC arbitration law. It was, uh, however, mentioned in some judicial interpretations as well as uh, some legislations, but uh, it's not clearly defined and uh, uh, there is uncertainty as to uh, the implications of uh, seat of arbitration, uh, particularly in regard to supervisory court, the lex arbitrary and nationality of award. So uh, for, uh, for, let's uh, take an example. If WIPO ever administer one arbitration in the free trade zone in Shanghai, which court will be the supervisory court? Would it be uh, the Shanghai court or would it be uh, the court of uh, WIPO's headquarter? So that, that's, uh, that's uncertain. And uh, which law shall govern the procedure? On this issue, I, I think uh, the logical answer would be the PRC law should necessarily govern the procedure, but there is no clarity on that issue. And uh, what is the nationality of a uh, WIPO's award rendered in Shanghai? So if we look back at the past cases, we probably cannot get a 100% clear answer. In 2004, the Supreme People's Court rendered a decision with regard to the Weimar International versus the Shanxi Tianli case. It is about the enforcement of an ICC award rendered in, Shanghai, uh, in Hong Kong. Sorry. So in that case, the Supreme People's Court considered such an award not as a Hong Kong award, but instead as a French award because ICC was headquartered in uh, Paris, France. And, uh, Following that logic, the SPC considered the legal basis for enforcing such a award to be the New York Convention. In 2009, uh, in the DeFalco case, this was a case by the Ningbo Intermediate Court for enforcement of uh, ICC award rendered in Beijing. The Ningbo Court considered such a award to be a non-domestic award under Article 1.1 of the New York Convention. And therefore, the legal basis for enforcement would be the New York Convention. But this decision draws a lot of uh, criticism in the industry. And most recently, uh, there's an interesting development. This is the Brentwood industry case. Guangzhou Intermediate Court enforcing a ICC award rendered in Guangzhou. And in its decision, the Guangzhou Court consider the award rendered by ICC in Guangzhou to be a foreign related arbitral award in PRC. And therefore the legal basis for enforcement would be the PRC arbitration law and the civil procedure law rather than New York convention. So um, it seems uh, following the logic of the Brentwood industry case, the if foreign institution register a uh, uh, case management office in China with the Department of Justice, then the logical answer would be such an award would be considered as a PRC foreign related award. And the legal basis for enforcement would be PRC law. However, this is the only happened in um, some random cases. And as mentioned by Yi Liang, China is a civil law uh, jurisdiction. So there is, uh, there needs to be some uh, clarification from the legislation. As for the availability of internal measures, I think um, although uh, the implementing measures from the Beijing or Shanghai Department of Justice does not mention the internal measures. Parties probably can still seek measures from the court in Beijing or, the Shang or Shanghai. And the Beijing Shanghai court probably would grant parties uh, application for internal measures. But uh, for arbitration in Beijing or Shanghai, 
the assets or the evidence to be thought to be fro frozen or attached are not necessarily in Beijing or Shanghai. So party would uh, probably be go to other courts for interim measures. So those other courts may not follow the Shanghai or Beijing Department of Justice implementing measures. So without a national legislation, um, there would be confusion, ambiguity uh, on the availability of interim measures from the PRC court in support of arbitration by foreign institutions, uh, case management offices in China. Uh, I, I think you will hear from Mr. Yang about the mainland China and Hong Kong arrangement on, inf uh, on interim measures in support of arbitration in each other's jurisdiction. Um, so Hong Kong International Arbitration Center and other institutions in Hong Kong now has these uh, advantages. Um, but this advantage is not available for other jurisdictions, for example, for Singapore city arbitration. So if those foreign institutions can set up a case management office and uh, parties to arbitration by those offices can have uh, access to interim measures, then, the, then this issue will not be a big issue. But so far, as I said, there is no clarity. And, and I think the reason why we are faced with uh, those difficult problems is because of a lack of a clarity on certain issues from the arbitration legislation. And those issues can only be resolved once and for all through further amendment of the arbitration legislation. If the, in the amendment that is uh, currently being discussed, the, if in the amended uh, legislation, the seat of arbitration is uh, clearly defined and uh, the several implications in, in connection with the seat can be expressly dealt with in the arbitration legislation, then all those doubts uh, would probably go away. So uh, I, in my view, there better to be a provision on the status of a foreign institutions in, in the new uh, legislation, saying that uh, the foreign institutions can be treated as a arbitration commission or foreign related arbitration commission in China. And that can resolve almost all the problems, including the availability of interim measures. Uh, that's all for my presentation, thank you. I hope I made myself clear. Thank you very much, Mr. Cao. So the presentation, I think, uh, just uh, introduced very clearly about the, the, the key contents and also the background of the relevant uh, policies, which is closely, which is, may have some uh, substantial impact on SIAC's operation in China. So now let's welcome Mr. Yang. And, and, he, and, he, and he will introduce the topic about the Hong Kong Main and China Interim Measures Agreement. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, it is my pleasure and privilege uh, to be invited and sit with uh, distinguished uh, colleagues uh, to give uh, this short presentation. I'm going to talk about a different subject, uh, uh, which is uh, interim measure and the arrangement with uh, mainland China. Now, uh, can I have the next slide? Uh, can I have the next? Yes. Uh, again, I'm not going to read everything. Uh, it's better to leave you to look at it uh, yourself. Uh, uh, I just want to emphasize that the uh, interim measure has been very important as we all, uh, all the practitioner in arbitration modes, uh, uh, some of the interim measures like search order and, uh, and freezing injunctions are called uh, entitled uh, nuclear weapons. And they really are. Uh, the, over the years, uh, even as arbitrator, which is not really involved in parties uh, matters, uh, you see uh, uh, when the, uh, uh, an injunction is obtained, 
uh, say, a freezing injunction, uh, uh, then it would put an end to an arbitration. The party just settle. Uh, you don't know what terms uh, they have settled, although sometimes you you are asked to write a consent or what, but many cases uh, you are you just you are just being told the tribunal is just being told that the party have settled, and uh, you can almost uh, uh, quite certain to uh, to see that the settlement would be in favor of the applicant of a freezing injunction uh, uh, and managed to successfully got the injunction. Uh, uh, the same apply to search order or even other type of injunctions, uh, 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 which of course um, uh, can be any type of a restraining injunction. Now, the, this uh, power, uh, intermeasure power, used to be with the uh, court, uh, the supervisory court, uh, 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 which uh, after the, uh, since uh, it has been for some years already, uh, since the ancestral model law, uh, 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 in Hong Kong has been taken on board as the Hong Kong Arbitration Ordinance, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, and that is quite early the, 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 uh, in the uh, uh, in 1995 uh, five or so, uh, whatever. Uh, the, the, I forgot the exact year. Uh, this power has been passed on to the arbitrator has been given on to the arbitrator, although there is still a concurrent power of interim measure at, uh, uh, the, the, uh, for example, the arbitral tribunal it has not yet been established. In that case, the national court or the supervisory court must step in to fill the gap. Uh, but otherwise, uh, it has now been very clear uh, that uh, when the tribunal is established and uh, is ongoing, uh, then the court would always try to take a, a second place uh, when it comes to an application for interim measures. Can I have the next slide? Of course, uh, 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 in, uh, the, the, if the arbitrator has uh, the power to grant interim measure, uh, then the, the enforcement, um, enforceability of the decision of interim measure has to be uh, uh, strengthened, has to be strengthened. And Hong Kong, I think is one of the first jurisdiction, if not the very first one, to take on board, to take on board the ancestral model law, the only amendment to the ancestral model law, uh, 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 which is now in the, the Hong Kong Arbitration Ordinance, uh, section 61. And it says, uh, although it's written clearly, but I'll read it out because of the importance, an order or direction made, whether in, in or outside, I'm sorry, <laughs> typoed here, in or outside Hong Kong. So in other words, uh, a foreign arbitral uh, tribunal making an intramarital order uh, can likewise uh, fall under this section 61. In relation to arbitral proceeding uh, by an arbitral tribunal is enforceable in the same manner as an order of, uh, of the court. Uh, of the Hong Kong court and has the same effect, uh, it, uh, but you have to get the leave of the court. Uh, and in most cases, I think the leave of court is very much rubber stamping. Now uh, that make means uh, uh, even a foreign arbitral uh, tradition, um, uh, any place uh, in the world, Singapore, uh, mainland China or elsewhere, London or USA, uh, whether it is made by the tribunal or a direct application to the Hong Kong court. Um, uh, for example, the tribunal has not yet been constituted especially. Now, can all be enforced uh, to under, uh, to, uh, uh, by the Hong Kong court? Uh, uh, one good example uh, I have cited here, which is, has been underlined uh, is uh, Beijing arbitration. The first Beijing Arbitration Commission emergency arbitration decision, uh, and that has been enforced in Hong Kong. And that was uh, some three, four, three years ago. Uh, it, has, uh, it is a mixture of uh, uh, asset disclosure, uh, disposal to, of asset restraint and anti-suit injunction, uh, 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 a, mi a mixture of those uh, intermeasures. Now, but the problem is, uh, it's difficult to, to, get, uh, to go wrong. For Hong Kong, uh, the lion's share of cases are mainland China related. And it would be difficult to get interim measures in China 
mainland China. Whereas China arbitration is very easy to get uh, uh, the support of Hong Kong court, uh, whether it, it is an international order made by the arbitral tribunal or a direct application. Now, uh, the New York Convention equivalent between Hong Kong and mainland China doesn't work because it has to do with an enforcement of an arbitration award. And it uh, doesn't apply to an uh, intermeasure, uh, which is usually uh, uh, not final. Uh, can I have the next uh, PPT? Next slide, please. Now, then comes the arrangement, uh, which I won't read out, read out the name. Uh, uh, and that has only to do with intermeasure. And that has taken into effect uh, since uh, 1st of October. Uh, but it, uh, even if you have arbitration commenced earlier uh, than the 1st of October 2019, uh, you can actually enjoy the arrangement. Uh, uh, can I have the next slide, please? Yes. Uh, the, now, the, uh, uh, the difficulty with mainland China is, uh, as I have laid out, uh, uh, the, I've already referred to you uh, Section 61 of the Hong Kong Arbitration Act, uh, and that has to do with the foreign uh, tribunal's uh, order for intermeasure. And then you can see Section 45 parties of arbitration seated anywhere can apply for intermeasure at Hong Kong as in our court. So Hong Kong is fully open, is extremely arbitration friendly and on an international basis. But if you look at PLC court, uh, you can apply for intermeasure uh, uh, either by the, only if it is a, a PLC court litigation or a PLC seated arbitration. And that's why I've just mentioned Hong Kong arbitration cannot get intermeasure in mainland China. There is no uh, uh, the other way around, so to say. Now. Uh, under the arrangement that uh, Hong Kong SAR, incidentally, SAR means a special administrative region uh, because Hong Kong is operating under one country, two system. Uh, this, uh, Hong Kong is the only jurisdiction uh, which, uh, uh, which is capable of applying for intermeasure in mainland China. And uh, we know the number of uh, arbitration cases coming out uh, or relating to China parties. Uh, and that is a very, very important uh, 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 thing, uh, I, I must say. Now, really, all you have to do is to apply to the mainland court or through one of the six uh, qualifying institutions in Hong Kong, starting with HKIC, uh, uh, ICC Hong Kong, and so forth. Um, uh, I won't read out all the names. Uh, 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 they will give you a certificate uh, 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 certifying that uh, it is an arbitration falling under one of those qualifying institutions. And then you can uh, apply direct to the Chinese court for intermeasure uh, uh, under the arrangement. Or you can even ask those institutions to actually uh, 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 forward the application for you. Uh, can I have the next slide? Now, uh, the intermeasures uh, are, uh, 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 I'm not going to spend time on this one. Uh, 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 essentially, the asset preservation, uh, which uh, in common law or in Hong Kong, we used to call it Mariva injunction, uh, or now the more commonly referred to as freezing injunction. The evidence preservation order uh, that comes all kinds, uh, whether it's against party or against uh, or potential parties uh, like uh, uh, search order or against third party like uh, Norwich Pharmacal order. And then uh, there is the conduct preservation order, uh, which you broadly, uh, broadly equivalent to common law jurisdiction like uh, restraining uh, injunction, which can be uh, any form. Uh, and that would include uh, an anti-suit injunction, as we know it these days. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, the number of cases uh, uh, that, uh, uh, which has just been reported, I just saw it in the uh, GAT news. Uh, and of course, uh, HKIC also make an official announcement. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, the, there are a lot of applications uh, for a very short period, relatively short period of time. And I'm not surprised because uh, 
anybody, um, any practitioner in arbitration and uh, acting for parties would think about uh, the, the intermeshes. Uh, almost every arbitration will have some uh, intermeshes one way or the other um, uh, as, uh, as uh, a, uh, ancillary measure. Uh, so the, now the, uh, the money involved um, uh, depends how you look at it is rather huge also. And you can see the bulk of the um, applications of those cases uh, falling under the arrangements are uh, asset preservation. Uh, next slide, please. And, and I will add most of them are successful as you can see uh, in the figure uh, the, which uh, indicated in the previous slide. Now, the, uh, this is the first case. Uh, this is a shipping case, uh, the, which, uh, uh, which I'm not going to uh, 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 talk much about it. Can I have the next uh, slide? Now, uh, the, the, as I have said, uh, most, uh, most applications have to do with asset uh, preservation in mainland China. And I'm not surprised uh, because uh, uh, China has been um, uh, doing this uh, preserve asset for a future claim, whether it's arbitration or court litigation for ages. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, 40 or 50 years ago, I've already know uh, about it. Uh, that has to do with arrest of ship. Uh, and arrest of ship has nothing to do with the arrangement. It is international convention, the arrest convention uh, for hundreds of years. Uh, uh, when you have ships moving around, then you can arrest uh, within your jurisdiction and obtain uh, security for the future claim, whether a claim or arbitration, court litigation. So China has been doing that for a long time. And uh, a lot of the current requirements have been set up uh, a long time ago. For example, any applicant to arrest the ship uh, or now the, to, uh, to, to, to application to preserve property will have to put up security uh, and so forth and so forth. Those were uh, practice uh, for quite a long while already. And I believe uh, mainland Chinese courts are very familiar with it. Uh, and that's why you have so many applications. Besides, preservation of assets can be very important in uh, international arbitration. The, uh, the, 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 so a lot of uh, asset preservation. Now, uh, other kinds of preservation like preserve evidence and so forth uh, are relatively less, I think. Uh, I've done some search. Uh, I've only seen uh, uh, one case uh, that, uh, and I'm not, uh, because the report is short, as you know, um, uh, first is the interim measure and se secondly, uh, a lot of uh, uh, the, the, the Chinese court report uh, might not be too lengthy in the reasoning. Reason. So I cannot see it, uh, but you can see at the bottom of the slide, there's a 2003 uh, case uh, and the application was CTEC for preservation of evidence against third party or the party. Uh, I think uh, it is a preservation uh, order against the party uh, and the third party. So it sounds like a mixture of search order uh, and Norwich Pharmacal uh, uh, the, the, the order. Uh, so, so a mixture of both. Uh, uh, I must say that um, in China, it is still not very clear uh, as to all these uh, intermeshes, uh, uh, whether it fall within the arrangement or within China. Uh, I think more jurisdiction, uh, jurisprudence, more jurisprudence or uh, perhaps law or perhaps notice uh, uh, from the uh, Supreme Court uh, would have to be, get, uh, to, be uh, to be given out in order that uh, people outside, uh, parties outside would have a better guidance as to the, the way uh, it can be handled. Uh, the, the very much uh, like uh, uh, people are more familiar with uh, preservation of asset uh, uh, because of the vast experience. And uh, I think uh, uh, if I'm wrong in that, uh, to, uh, perhaps uh, uh, to, uh, to Mr. Tsai Li Jun would, would, uh, would correct me whether, whether the, my perception is right or not. Can I have the next slide? Now, the other kind of uh, preservation of conduct, which is restraining injunction, uh, I'm also not very clear because, again, uh, I don't see a lot of cases, uh, especially relating to arbitration. Now. Uh, 
uh, if you look at the law, it is a power granted to IP cases, intellectual property cases, uh, uh, which you can, uh, uh, you can, for example, make a restraining injunction that you cannot, uh, 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 you cannot uh, ta, 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 uh, to continue to do this and that uh, until uh, uh, the IP uh, dispute has been resolved by the court. Uh, so there will be a, 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 a so to say, in, uh, interlocutory injunction uh, followed by perhaps a final injunction in the arbitration of what. Uh, so uh, in China, you can do these things uh, and the law is clear. But it is not certain whether uh, this power is, uh, can be granted in other non-IP cases. Uh, that is not very clear. Again, I tried to do some search. Uh, 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 I must admit, not very diligently, but I managed to find a link uh, which has, uh, again, related to a, a CTEC arbitration. Uh, there, it cannot be a foreign arbitration, of course. Uh, uh, foreign CTEC arbitration other than Hong Kong uh, will not be able to apply uh, the, to start with. So it must be a CTEC arbitration, uh, which has been reported uh, that uh, a restraining injunction has been granted uh, in the case. Again, I hope in due course, uh, uh, jurisprudence will be built up and more information will be known. And I'm quite sure this arrangement will do serve Hong Kong arbitration extremely well. Now I come to the last PPT and I hope to be in time. Uh, again, the pros and cons of arrangement, everything has uh, benefit and, and, uh, and there are other things uh, which might not be so good, uh, although everybody put it in, in Hong Kong now put it in a very positive light. Uh, now to the world, the arrangement put Hong Kong arbitration in a uniquely advantageous position uh, in dealing with CR, uh, PLC related arbitration. Uh, I think uh, most parties would think about interim measures, the importance of it, uh, would start to think, ah, Hong Kong arbitration is important in that sense, uh, if it relates to PLC, of course. Now, uh, the pros and cons, the cons now, I, uh, I thought, um, uh, I'm a little worried, again, uh, not a lot of people would echo uh, my sentiment. Uh, if look at mainland Chinese companies, uh, 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 because uh, if you have an asset preservation, it can sometimes bring a lot of pressure. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, many of them surrender. Uh, many, uh, a lot of pressure, uh, sometimes injustice uh, to mainland uh, small and medium company. And uh, I'm not sure, I sometimes even feel uh, the Chinese court might be a little liberal in granting our preservation of property or preservation of asset. Uh, with the mentality of arresting ships in the old days, which uh, is relatively easy under the International Arrest Convention. So uh, Hong Kong uh, might be uh, looked at as unfavorable to some of the mainland uh, small and medium companies or by some of the mainland lawyers acting for them. I'm not so sure. Uh, uh, that, uh, especially all the assets are within China. If they have worldwide, <clears throat> assets outside, then of course it's a different matter. Now, my second worry, da, 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 again, I've heard some rumor already, but I don't know how true it is. I certainly cannot be uh, any closer to the truth than uh, Mr. Tao Li Jun, uh, he would like to confirm that there are other places uh, lobbying uh, to have the same arrangement. I'm not sure Singapore is one, to, uh, to, uh, uh, but I'm not surprised in the sense that uh, good things uh, will not never last too long as we all know it. Uh, uh, and PRC is likely to come up with uh, 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 arrangement with other jurisdiction. And uh, PRC may even change law to take on board uh, uh, the spirit of ancestral model law. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, and of course, uh, to, uh, uh, Mr. Lee Jun has been talking about uh, uh, amending uh, PLC law. So all these things uh, means that uh, uh, how long will Hong Kong enjoy this exclusive benefit uh, is uncertain. Uh, but perhaps uh, let's make hay while the sun shines. Uh, and that's all I have to present. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you, Mr. Yang. 
Mr. Chung and Mr. Chao, thank you very much for your fantastic presentations. So while Mr. Yang is speaking, we have dealt with some of the questions, but we still have one question remaining about the Singapore law firm's participation uh, before a China-related arbitration. So how about uh, Mr. Chung? Would you like to answer this question? Yeah, uh, at, at this stance, uh, as far as I'm aware, it is still pretty uncommon for uh, foreign arbitration or rather foreign element arbitration to be conducted in, in uh, PRC. And as such, I, I think the involvement of Singapore law firm in, in PRC seated arbitration is relatively rare at the moment. And in fact, if you look at the Daesung case, that's probably the first, uh, as far as I'm aware, reported case where you have a SIAC administered arbitration that is seated in Shanghai. Uh, hopefully, uh, the, the, inter the international arbitration scene in PRC will continue to improve and we will see more and more involvement of uh, the international arbitration community in PRC. And hopefully by then, then uh, law firms in Singapore or even law firms in other parts of the world will become active in, in, in PRC. But at the moment, I don't think it is a common occurrence. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chung. Oh, okay, Mr. Chung, please. Yeah, if I may, uh, speaking from the perspective of uh, restrictions by the PRC authorities, uh, foreign, any foreign law firms, uh, they can represent clients, uh, namely acting as counsel in arbitration uh, in the PRC. That mainly refers to arbitration by uh, Chinese institutions such as uh, CTEC or BAC. Uh, the only restriction is uh, about their role uh, when it comes to the time for interpreting, uh, interpreting the PRC law. So the requirement is that whenever PRC law comes up, uh, it's better, uh, it, it is required that a uh, uh, PRC legal opinion be obtained before the hearing, or uh, if the foreign firm acting as counsel can involve a PRC lawyer as co-counsel uh, to deal with the PRC uh, law issues when it comes up. So that will satisfy the requirement. Uh, so this is, as I said, in relation to uh, arbitration by PRC domestic institutions, such as CTEC. With regard to foreign institutions offices in China, if those offices uh, can conduct case management functions um, for those arbitrations, uh, conducted by such offices, uh, will there be limited uh, restriction or reduced restriction towards foreign lawyers role in such case? Uh, that remain to be clarified, but I think uh, probably yes, because uh, those are, um, you know, uh, the foreign institutions in essence. So there should be less restrictions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cao. Uh, Mr. Yang, would you like to say anything about the, uh, the questions from the attendees or anything about this webinar? Mr. Yang? So, sorry, you're muted. Uh, yes. I, uh, I'm not sure which questions are. Uh, so, so, okay. Uh, so how about the, the questions about the HKIAC? The challenge of HKIC cases uh, because I cannot I cannot find it in the uh, Q and A. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know why. Uh, I only find that uh, uh, I I I think uh, for such an interesting and informative uh, uh, seminar, <laughs> that, uh, which is compliment, uh, uh, which is uh, the, the grateful, that, but it's not a question. And uh, uh, okay. the other one is the, the landscape present a change on exit matters. I'm not uh, sure the question that you refer to. Okay, okay, understood. So, so, so maybe we, we will figure that out later after this webinar. So thank you all, uh, Mr. Yang, Mr. Chung and Mr. Cao. Thank you very much for your, for your presentations. And I wish we, had, we would have more time for you to uh, discuss more about these important topics 
uh, related to the PRC arbitration practices. So, and, and thank you all for all the attendees, which are still above 100, are still with us. And we, I hope we can uh, deliver more, more events uh, for all, all of our users around the world. So if you have any questions or comments about this webinar, or if you have anything uh, to discuss about the China-related matters of the Singapore International Arbitration Centers, you may con contact me uh, via email or cell phone. So you can find my, uh, find my numbers on the SIS's website. So thank you all very much uh, and hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Chen Yue. Thank you. Thanks very thank much, you. everyone. Thank you. Have, have, a, have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.